Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third in the COVID-19 response digital discussion series. Um, it's been put together by Alliance for Impact, Impact 17 and Meaningful Business. This time, uh, we're going to hear about how businesses can support the vital work of charities. Before we start, we're also taking the opportunity to convey to you some key messages from our colleagues at the World Health Organization. Uh, we just came off a call with them and they've asked us to repeat some uh, key messages for businesses to prioritize the health of staff um, and the community around your businesses, including the customers, clients and supply chains. Um, they're also asking that you look at the business continuity, you look at your, your companies and about how during and post this COVID-19 crisis, you can continue. There is a communications issue. So um, please do refer to the World Health Organization's website for the most up-to-date and accurate information. Um, and we ask you also to, to amplify that. If you're interested in making a financial contribution for critical medical supplies, then there is a, um, the website for that is listed and we'll be sharing that in our message to you after the call. There will soon be something where um, we'll be able to share where WHO is, uh, um, we'll be telling you about how to contribute um, critical items on a list that they've prepared as well. So today we're really pleased to welcome a um, fantastic group of speakers um, who can speak directly to the issue. So um, with us we have Michelle Geyer, who's the Director of Emergency Health at the International Rescue Committee, um, who's been able to take a, um, an hour out of a very busy day, as you can imagine. We also have Ignacio Paca, who's the CEO of the International Council the voluntary agencies representing a, a number of NGOs around the world. We have Kamal Hotti, um, non-executive director of TLC Lions, who has a tremendous background in supporting uh, charities from within the private sector and advising them and businesses on how to uh, work with each other. But also in that same vein, we have Eric Berseth, the founder and managing partner of Philanthropy Advisors. We'll start with um, a question to all our panelists, and it's the question of the subject matter of, uh, of this digital discussion. How can businesses support charities' vital work? So we'll start with Ignacio, and then um, I'll ask all the other panelists to, to chip in. Yes, thank you, uh, Andy. Yes. IGVA, as you said, it's a network of NGOs, 130 NGOs. Uh, large ones, the diversity like IRC, an outreach of 8,000 8, uh, NGOs. Uh, the operational footprint of the members is $20 billion, 180 countries. What is the collective vital work that we're talking about? Three things. One, to contain the spread of the COVID-19. Uh, it's about morbidity and mortality. Two, it's about the decrease of the deterioration of the human assets, of issues around human rights, of our social cohesion, of our livelihoods. Three, it's about the protection, the assistance, and uh, to be advocates of, for refugees, uh, IDPs, uh, migrants, uh, host, host communities. And my key message, uh, we need to focus on people and on the most vulnerable. And we need to get resources directly in the hands of people. And now the business community can support uh, NGOs to achieve this. We need to accelerate responsible and flexible partnership agreements between the private sector and the diversity of NGOs and other humanitarian actors. And in doing this, the partnerships have to support local leadership and uh, local participation in coordination and decision making. And I, I would just add one more thing is I would like to formulate three calls and I hope during, during the hour we have, we'll be able to develop them a bit. 
Three calls on the opportunities for the business community to link, uh, further link with NGOs. One, on resourcing. Identifying opportunities for investments and funding for the short term, but also on system changing interventions. The second one is support and collaboration. Work on collaborative responses between NGOs, civil society organizations, governments, business for COVID uh, related support. And the third one is around advocacy on how jointly business community and NGO community can influence policy and through concrete recommendations. And I hope I'll be able to develop some of those uh, in, the, in the course of the, the discussion. Thank you, Andy. Michelle, let's turn to you, and then we have Kamel, and we'll finish with Eric. Um, thanks, Andy. Um, I, I have to say, uh, I think, you know, in the last few years, the private sector companies have really stepped up um, in their support, uh, both financially and beyond, to global humanitarian crises. And I think COVID-19 um, is really now, where private sector leadership is needed more than ever. Um, obviously, we need funding, right? Um, but we can do this in many ways. And the private sector, um, I can think of three ways of, uh, and I'm following on a little bit from um, Ignacio's comments there because uh, you know, we didn't prepare together, but I feel like you know, we're very much on, the, on exactly the same path. Um, first, you know, engaging uh, your, com your customers to raise funds. Um, private sector can do so much uh, through promotional sales supporting NGO charities, for example. Just a practical example of using your leverage, your customers to help uh, us do our vital work. Um, uh, support was mentioned. Um, I think secondly, you can help us provide essential needs for vulnerable populations. Um, and this doesn't have to be in-kind donations. Um, things like phone credits, delivery credits, transport and logistics to help us deliver things. That's hugely important in this crisis right now and we just don't have that support. Um, and the third thing um, that I'd, I'd like to raise now is, is that influence point. And I want to say that we're dealing with potentially a double emergency. Um, when I say double emergency, it's, there's so many parts of the world that are in humanitarian crises right now. Um, the IRC serves um, some of the most vulnerable. Aid has to continue to, follow, to, to flow and to follow, right? And right now, many governments are inward looking, trying to sort out their own problems. Fair enough but companies can play a huge role right now and being an influencer, playing that vital role through your customers, but also through your staff to influence and say, look, there are many, many settings in this world. They're gonna have a hundred times worse situation. We need to continue vital healthcare, vital safe water and sanitation for these populations. We cannot forget that. So I think you know, funding, yes, support to deliver some of our work, that vital work that we do, but really raising that awareness to make sure that the aid flows. I think are some critical ways in which the private sector can support NGOs. Over for now. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so thank you so much. And I think we're all very aligned with what we're thinking. So for me, coming from a very corporate background, um, this is something really close to my heart. And you're absolutely right, Michelle. I think the business world has woken up, especially after the 2008 financial crisis that we no longer can keep on talking about shareholder value, that there was another way of actually doing business. So that's been great. Um, but I'd like to bring it down to really down to individuals. So the individual employee to what they can do, because I think if you keep it really simple and get the people within the organization really firing up and wanting to support, then the business you know, machine comes into play. So I've tried to um, segment this into three things. So first of all, very much, <clears throat> It's the in-kind. If you haven't got, if a business hasn't got the, because obviously business is struggling at the moment as well at the same time, what can they do? So if it's not money, what can you give an in-kind? Do you have products sitting in your warehouses that you can actually give to a charity that they can sell on and make money that way? Or could they have their drivers be driving some of the, the, the equipment that you might need? Um, so there's stuff I think in in-kind that could be done if there was collaboratively locally in the local place. But more importantly, when we look at our workforce and take away the money side of thing 
we've got strategists, we've got marketeers, we've got digital designers, we've got web designers, people who are now sitting at home who can't leave their home. How can we use those skill sets in a way to really release some of that pressure to be able to strategize now to help build your marketing campaigns, to look at your digital websites, where charities especially who aren't very good at their digital communications I really think there is something there that will actually give us a win-win, both from the charity and the NGO point of view, but for individuals and businesses where colleagues are feeling really anxious and it's human nature. If I feel like I'm adding value, I know I feel good. It'll take away my own anxiety. So how do we actually connect? And rather than thinking big, what's something on your local doorstep? Is there a charity on your local doorstep that could belong to a big NGO in, in the biggest... So I think there is something that we can connect locally, first of all, what is one person can do themselves. But then more importantly, I think when we look at global footprints, very much as international companies who've got you know, international footprints, where are the CEOs? Let them come out, let them talk, let them show their vulnerability, take your masks off and showcase what role that you want your company and your brand to play. Because people, trust me, will remember the role that you played in this crisis. Whether that's you taking a lead, whether that's you handing over a check in this time that you're not gonna actually fundraise. Money that you know, I know in Lloyd's Banking Group, we used to raise money, but we also know how much money was invested in order to raise that money in the first place. And we hated wanting to give over a check, but maybe this is a time where we just give over a check. So if you are in that opportunity, you are those international companies that can give over a check. Where are the CEOs and role models who really speak up? Because I think that's where colleagues are looking for their leadership within their companies. They want to be proud of their brand, that they played a role. So I think there's an international place for role models. There's individuals within the company, what they can do locally with their skill sets but also as in kind, what are the products and things that you can physically do that might be able to take some of that pressure on, on, on the NGOs and charities at the moment. Thank you, uh, Kamel. Thank you, Andy, for the invitation. Uh, Kamel, Ignacio, Michel, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you with, with, uh, along your side today. I'm happy to be a bit torn in between, you know, in, in the private sector and working with the private sector on one side and with humanitarian actors and developments and social actors on the other side. I'll try not to be redundant because a, a lot of things have been said by, by my colleagues here, but um, I think some things where the business can support charities uh, during the COVID-19 obviously is boosting, for the ones who are producing health commodities, obviously is boosting their uh, production uh, capacity, you know, on PPE, protective, uh, personal protective equipment, mask ventilators, hand sanitizers and all that, and obviously make them available to health frontliners. I think it's essential. Uh, uh, some companies we've seen also have been repurposing their production facilities and we have, uh, you know, the list of examples is super long with, uh, you know, Canada Goose, for example, uh, producing or using their production facilities to make PPE for frontline workers uh, in Canada, but also LVMH, Pernod Ricard, uh, Bulgari, Firmenich producing hand sanitizer, Fendi. Uh, and Chanel working also around uh, uh, masks, uh, etc. So it's interesting to see that the ones who can support the, the health uh, frontliners, uh, charities, uh, can, can find a way to support them and has the capacity to support them. But um, I think this is one category, but we really need to make sure that we are not forgetting all the others. I think it's fundamental not to think about only the charities participating to the health response, but also all the other ones. And for the companies who are willing to support these organizations, there's other ways to engage. Uh, providing funding. I mean, obviously, as you know, the other, my other colleagues mentioned, funding and quick funding, not only for the COVID-19, but to allow these organizations to survive during these times because they are hit twice, if not three times, but at least twice. They are all hit with the COVID-19, uh, directly affected by the crisis, but they also see a surge of uh, beneficiaries or potential beneficiaries who are themselves affected by COVID-19. So lacking funds, affected by COVID-19 and having more beneficiaries can put them in some difficult situations. So funding is, is tremendous for, again, all uh, charities working, whether it's in health, but also in education, uh, child protection, uh, women empowerment, all the, all, all the other ones. Uh, provide non-medical goods, uh, you were mentioning it uh, before, food, shelter, real estate. Uh, you know, we've had some very interesting cases with Airbnb providing apartments closer to health facilities, host, uh, hotels hosting patients, restaurants, uh, providing food to, uh, to uh, frontline workers and, uh, and all this, uh, this kind of uh, non-medical and services and last but not least 
uh, and Kamel, I think you will be probably elaborating more on this, but providing skilled or non-skilled pro bono uh, activities. You were speaking about the ones that were, you know, inactive during this time. I can, you know, propose some skilled uh, work around, uh, you know, communication, fundraising capacity, accounting, supply logistics, coordination, all that. But let's, let's not forget also about the non-skilled. Uh, you know, pro bono you could give. I have a very good example here in France with uh, the food banks, for example, where you have a lot of uh, uh, volunteers who are older and uh, most of the time, I mean, I would say half of their staff is, is uh, retired people and these are the most at-risk people at the moment. So they are just basically lacking uh, people who could be just distributing uh, items to people who are uh, uh, living in the streets, for, for example. So companies can put at the disposal of these organizations some of their staff who are less likely to be at risk to be affected by the COVID-19. Over to you, Andy. Right, well, well, thanks very much for kicking us off, panelists. We have um, <clears throat> questions coming into us from the, the chat platform that um, not everybody can see. Some of them are just coming to um, the panelists only. And there's one from Monica Miskelly. Um, which is, does a platform exist where people can see what business skills and support are needed? Now, we can tell you that the World Health Organization, as an example, has such a, a platform, but it, as I mentioned earlier, they're accepting offers only for critical items listed on something called the Emergency Global Supply Chain Catalog. And we will be sharing information in our follow-up with you on that. Um, now we'll go to our first verbal question from the floor, and that is from Elizabeth McLean. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, and it is a pleasure to be with each of you today virtually. Um, I'm Elizabeth McLean. My consultancy is Nosaic, and I'm located in the Washington, D.C. area. And here is my question. What is the most pressing internal operational or process need for your organizations at this time. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think we'll direct that one to, um, to Michelle. Um, and hopefully, Michelle, you, as a frontline humanitarian NGO, the International Rescue Committee is, you know, you're in 40 countries as well. Maybe you can add to that question. Uh, what are the biggest concerns you're seeing on the ground as well as inside International Rescue Committee. Um, okay, thank you very much for that um, question. Um, I think you know one of the biggest concerns for us, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of as internal operations and our needs. Um, first of all, in, in a lot of the situations in which we work, um, the highly vulnerable populations, a lot of overcrowding, and very poor access to water and sanitation. So you know, the two critical things we have to do, social distancing and hand hygiene, it's very hard to, to practice. And so one of our biggest concerns is actually rapid and intense transmission in many of the settings in which we work. But the second thing is, is healthcare access. I mean, many of the, the, these countries and settings in which we work providing, um, and in most of these settings are conflict affected, are long-term conflict affected countries like Yemen, DR Congo, South Sudan, uh, huge refugee hosting countries like Bangladesh. So these are the settings in which we work. Healthcare access is already really difficult, right? Um, not enough staff, uh, not enough beds, um, sometimes no, not even water in, inside a hospital. So you can imagine how difficult it is to provide healthcare and not just for COVID, for all the other things that we need to provide healthcare for. The other two things I'm really worried about actually, um, a shortage of basic goods uh, with, uh, with a lot of transport and things being shut down, um, you know, things like flour, salt, basic food, uh, the prices are going up. So how are our populations going to get just basic needs? And then the fourth thing, the people are living already well below the poverty line, the very little livelihoods that they have. Um, and particularly if you think about women um, who may have short-term work, contract labor, they're going to be at highest risk to lose livelihoods and, you know, really, really make that poverty even worse. So these are some of the huge worries that, that, that we have. Um, I think in terms of, uh, I guess, three critical things, I would say, you know, our work to be able to do our healthcare work, our water and sanitation work, our protection work. We also work on econ economic recovery and livelihoods as, as well as education. We need access to population. We, we are there at the front line. 
Now with lockdowns um, in many countries coming along, we can't move. And so this is a critical internal issue for us. How do we program remotely um, and maybe use some of, uh, some of the, um, uh, the, the assets and skills of our you know, pro bono work to help us do this? It, it, we cannot access some of our population. So lockdowns are going to a huge problem internally. Um, the second thing is um, the global supply chain. And I'm not talking about only PPE. I'm talking about just medicines for pneumonia, other things, malaria, et cetera. We can't get them into some countries because extensive screening processes means that they're stuck at ports, not to mention that there are not enough flights um, and transport uh, restrictions. Um, but linked to that supply chain is our own staff safety. So for us, we have healthcare staff. If we don't have enough PPE, personal protective equipment, masks and face shields, we have a huge breach in staff safety. So it's not just our clients, but you know, our priority is also to make sure our staff who are delivering healthcare are safe. And that is a huge internal problem for us. If we, if we don't have at the moment um, more than three to four weeks of supply in some countries of personal protective equipment for our frontline healthcare workers. And in some countries, it's not even that. Um, how do they continue to see patients, right? Um, and then I think, you know, I come back to this, uh, the final problem, which is we have many procedures and protocols. We've been working on them since, you know, late January. Um, of how we would adapt our program. So when we deliver healthcare or when we're providing safe water, we've taken WHO guidance and said, right, how do we adapt them so that the clients as well as us can be safe? How do we do this at two meters apart? How do we uh, provide counseling um, for mental health uh, and psychosocial support uh, in this way? Or we have those protocols and plans and we can adapt them. But again, as I say, um, as the global networks well looks on onto itself and governments look on itself that aid is falling um, and, and governments are not continuing uh, and um, to, to provide that critical financing that we need to actually be able to adapt some of our, um, some of our programs as I said before we need to continue delivering those basic essential life-saving services which uh, we're being cut uh, to do in a sense. You can ask you are you find similar response from the members of ICFA as well? Yeah, for sure. IRC is one, is one of our members and what, uh, what Michelle is saying resonates uh, a lot. And I'll be building on what Michelle said on, on the access to population, perhaps to, to, to start with, on that field presence, on the operational footprint, which is key. That's what NGOs bring. NGOs do two thirds of the humanitarian, the, the formal humanitarian system. Who do we meet there? Small and medium enterprises. So that's, and they're, they're suffering terribly in the formal sector, in the informal sector. And that means livelihoods for the people that we care, we care for. So this is where things join. And I was speaking to organizations in Iran, in Jordan, and in Tanzania this week of how innovation also in ways of connecting small and medium enterprises, formal and informal, and the work of NGOs. Why? Local actors. INGOs have local staff, and then there are the local NGOs. Mm -hmm. That is what this emergency, more than ever, has to rely upon, because that is the element of proximity to the population for messaging, for, su for support. And NGOs are adapting as well as they can and um, um, Michelle gave some examples for more remote, remote work, working differently, but we are all impaired in the way we are, uh, we are to work. And there are elements of innovation that have to come there. I'd like to, to, to come also on the, on the element that uh, Michelle talked about, which is around the ability uh, to, uh, for procurement. Where, where do we find PP, uh, PPE, ma uh, masks, me medicines, but more than that, it's about food, food entering in areas of, uh, of Afghanistan, of Yemen. The COVID is, is a health crisis, but it's far from being the major crisis that we're on. Pockets of starvation are going to start very, very rapidly. So how can the private sector also work on this issue of, uh, uh, with the commercial airlines, grounded or very much grounded 
So the UN are, are putting together common services to serve also the NGOs in, in bringing staff, but, but very importantly, in, in bringing different commodities which are needed for us, uh, for us to, to, to work on. If, if I could bring Camille and Eric in on, on this side, is how, can, how do you guys feel that um, the businesses can help address some of the needs that Ignacio and Michelle have highlighted, both on the ground, but also inside um, the NGOs themselves? Uh, shall I go, Eric, first? Um, yes, please well, go. First of all, I think uh, just on a, as a creative outline, uh, yes, I'm talking about businesses. Um, I'm a Sikh. Um, so, you know, in each part of every country, there are Gurdwaras at the moment. I don't know whether you've seen the stories of we provide free langar, which is food that is made healthily and using all the protocols, you know, being social isolation. And in India, for example, they're feeding hundreds of thousands of people still that food is being made and distributed. I'm just mm. wondering whether being creative, we have to think outside of the box is how do you create? It's not just businesses. Maybe this is an opportunity where humanity does come together, where religion has always divided us apart, but are there uh, religious uh, organizations where professionals like me working and volunteer as well, that they could actually come together and actually be your voice and be able to be another community that you could tap into, whether it's food, making food and distributing food, or actually using their creative ways and their contacts to actually bring you some insight rather than just relying on businesses. Certainly is happening in, in India at the moment where the Sikh uh, Godwaras are playing a core part in providing uh, food for the slums in Mumbai or in Delhi. So it could be just an opportunity. As far as businesses are concerned, I think again, um, it's, you know, being creative. Um, LinkedIn, we know that that's where businesses are or where the professionals can, can contact. How can you reach out to who you know? Your black book, my black book, how do we connect and reach out? Be a bit more, be a bit more bullshit, I suppose, and sending a message out on LinkedIn. You know, do you want me to post something that reaches out to whether it's a commodity or whether it's PPP or whether it's food? You know, they're always saying that, you know, if you want to touch somebody, there are three connections, three dots, if you want to reach somebody. I truly believe that. I might not know the person that you want, but if I go out through my network, maybe there is somebody that will answer that call for you in your region that you're looking out for. So I think it's just using the, the way that businesses normally connect and network. I think NGOs should be doing the same. Who do they know? How can they now be really, you know, be in your face? If you don't ask, you don't get. Um, and maybe that's another way. Mm. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd like to come back to what Michelle and, and Yester were saying also before. I think what is super interesting is to see, uh, I mean, we, we can't imagine when you're not working in a humanitarian system, um, how the staff, you know, HR issues are being hit now with the COVID-19. I mean, we have people working in countries, you know, like conflict affected you know, countries, Afghanistan, Yemen, South Sudan, uh, uh, Somalia, and these kind of countries, Iraq, Syria where we have staff or you know international the, the the icrc for example has staff in uh, yemen they don't know if they can take them out uh, for you know different issues because they don't know if they'll be able to fly them in and the point Inacio was making before it's super interesting because it's a moment also where some of you know it, it's showing that the working with local staff and local ngos is tremendously important for so many reasons that we all know, but also to be able to cope with you know these kind of emergencies. Something also that is coming out, and this is linking with the private sector. It's uh, for the ones who've been working in emergency responses, especially around natural disasters. The first responders are local companies everywhere. The, the you know the SMEs, they are the ones who are providing food, shelter, uh, 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 doing in-can donations and, 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 and things like this. So what is interesting is to see, and for me it was, I mean, having spent 10 years on acute emergencies field, uh, witnessing this from Paris is, is something that is totally new. I mean, where we have local companies, big ones, small ones, individuals, friends, colleagues, staff, employees, who are trying to do their best to, uh, you know, take uh, a part of, uh, or their part in the response. And, um, this is also a good opportunity for the companies to understand how these organizations are usually working. They have protocols, they know how to deal with emergencies, and this is something that they can learn also from the charity uh, uh, environment. 
because we often think that uh, businesses can bring things to the uh, you know NGOs or international organizations, but the other way around is also uh, uh, true. So here it's a very good example where these organizations can bring something to the to the private sector. Great, thanks very much, Eric. I think we're going to try and cram in some uh, questions from the attendees now. Um, the next question is coming from Kerry McGlade, and I think it's going to be relevant to um, to all of you. So, Kerry, over to you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, and thanks for taking the time today. And I think all of you have touched on this briefly, so if we can go into it a bit more, I'd really appreciate it. I'm the Vice President of Business Development with um, nonprofit Self-Help Africa, and our office is based in New York. Um, so as a nonprofit, how can we best position our relevancy if we're not direct medical providers? Um, before the uh, panelists answer that, Kerry, can I, mm -hmm. I'll keep you there so that you can respond and tell me afterwards if they've answered your question. Okay? Sure, yeah, okay. happy to. So who wants to try first? Let's start with, um, well, let's start with Michelle, I think. Uh, thanks, Kerry. Um, you know, in some of the uh, responses that uh, myself and Ignacio were um, giving beforehand in terms of the needs, obviously the, the needs are wildly beyond health. And whilst healthcare is critical at this time because people will be seeking healthcare, um, it's everything else. Um, we meant, I mentioned before that you know, prices of flour and food uh, are going up. So it's everything. Uh, people need help in you know, getting raw products uh, and commodities into countries. They need to be able to eat to survive. Uh, they need support on continuing their livelihoods in some way. And you know, there's a range of different livelihoods around. Um, and so a self-help organization, nonprofit, can you know, engage in numerous number of ways. And, and I really liked um, uh, when Eric was talking about um, you know, entrepreneurship and, and local SMEs are doing so much. We can support you know, local organizations and entities um, and individuals to you know, anything to make, allow them to continue their livelihood in any way. I mean, I, I was thinking uh, just as someone was talking, imagine if um, we could have some kind of, you know, technology transfer, one uh, couple of SMEs in Europe you know, get together with a range of like coalition of uh, local um, institutions in you know, a lot of African countries. And we, they all make you know, locally produced alcohol hand gel. Why not you know, try and use this to you know, get a coalition of um, entrepreneurs and ideas uh, in many different ways. I, I focus on health obviously, because that's my background. But you know, this could be done for, for many other products and many other commodities that are essential goods. Uh, and I think you know, this is critical at this time. It, it, it's not only a health crisis. Um, you know in your own countries what's going on. Um, you know, uh, people aren't going to school. People are losing jobs. Um, it, it, everything that you're experiencing in your own country right now is going to be experienced in many of these countries, but 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times worse just because of the situation that they're already in. I think, Camille, with um, a private sector lens, um, if you're looking at an NGO that's not a medical um, provider, how can they best position themselves in the eyes of the private sector in order to generate interest and, and some collaboration there, do you think? Um, thank you for that question, because that used to be one of my biggest frustrations. If we just go before COVID-19 and maybe now and then what goes forward, but before that, you know, as big international companies and corporates, we constantly get knocked on the door, you know, we want to be your charity partnership. The biggest mistake I would say, or well, mistake, but frustration was that there was a bit of an arrogance that, you know, the charity and the NGOs will knock on our doors and say, because you do good and you, 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 are, you make money, therefore you should be proud that we've knocked on your door and why aren't we your partner? So I, what I would say from the sense of that journey is actually when you do knock on somebody's door or you want somebody's attention to do some homework, go onto their website, have a look at their strategy, have a look at their values and their behaviors or where the lens is, what is their mindset? What is that company trying to achieve in this next year? And what would your partnership look like? And it can't be just about shaking a bucket and raising money. Try to think broader along the lines of what would the collaboration look like? Is it about a product that this company does. I mean, in banking, for example, when we did Alzheimer's, it was right, actually, what could we do to actually talk about dementia? 
well, actually, we have customers who bank with us constantly giving money away without any thought of, you know, families who are really frustrated. So we changed our policies on um, uh, power of attorneys. We trained 9,000 staff on the front line on dealing with people with dementia walking into the floor. So what is the role of the charity? It has to be more than just shaking a bucket. So to really think about the company you're about to knock on the door. What is their lens? What are their values and behaviors that they talk about? How can you enhance that values and behaviors? But what is the legacy? It has to be a, a win-win situation saying that our partnership by you raising funds for us or you helping us doing this program, in return, your brand, your colleagues will be able to volunteer. Your brand will be seen like this by your customers. Because now, not just customers want to bank and buy things from people that are ethical, but also employees want to go and work for companies that are ethical. Millenniums are looking for brands that are actually, whether it be plastics or, you know, they, they feel that they're, they're, the execs really live the values and behaviors we invest so much money in, in attracting talent, how do we retain it? A charity can play a core part in helping really shake that up. So do some homework, look at the strategy, look at how you can really improve the brand profile of that company. And what is the legacy of that campaign? What are you gonna leave behind that the brand can say, actually, we help like this? Because people, uh, companies like to think they've built something if they can leave a legacy, they're more likely to renew that partnership with that with that charity or the NGO. If you can, if you can, if I can just jump in. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, uh, Kerry. I think there's uh, practically also to be eligible. You you basically have two two chances. The first one is just to say what part are you doing uh, in the COVID nineteen response? Even if it's not health, there's probably things that are related. I wouldn't say that this is the most uh, you know relevant uh, way to answer that or to be eligible. But then the other way is just to show how important your work is and what what uh, Kamel and, and Michelle were mentioning. I mean, the needs for people who are in programs of education, of uh, again child protection, all these things they just did not disappear from one day to another. So it's just making sure that you are making the case that uh, you, uh, I mean, you, your beneficiaries or the beneficiaries of your, of your, of your program are you know, still there and still in need. And uh, it, it's also something that is interesting to link with, with businesses. I mean, it, it's a globalized world. Everything is connected. I mean, today we see that people who were employees one day, now they are you know, attending at food banks. Businesses can understand that and they also they I mean they want to protect their employees. They want to protect their customers They want to protect their supply chains So they understand that there's a rational for them also to engage in supporting people whenever they are going to trouble times Because it's also benefiting their their company and Kamel your point that very much I could not agree more with you uh, You need to make a case for the companies businesses more and more are understanding I mean obviously that they are part of a globalized world they understand that uh, if, if you know, they feel a responsibility, and especially I mean, COVID-19, they are directly affected, so they understand that they need to be part of the response uh, uh, as well, so they feel this responsibility, but there's a business rationale for them to support charities, and you, people need to stop hiding from this. Businesses, it's good for the businesses to engage. It's good for the HR, human resources, you were mentioning, Kamel, you know, millennials attracting talent, slower turnover, staff engagement, et cetera. It's good also for the consumers. They're ready to pay even more for services of coming from company and goods coming from companies who are responsible. It's also good in terms of image, communication, uh, you know, branding positioning. It's also an opportunity to develop products, uh, markets, et cetera, or just, you know, test opportunity, uh, 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 test uh, internal emergency procedures, so many things. Uh, again, it, it's just for the matter or for the sake of having a mutual understanding to understand what you can bring to the companies and what the companies can bring to the charity, keeping in mind and making sure that you also on the, you, you, you put on the table and make sure that it's clear for the companies who engage that your purpose is to do properly to attend to the beneficiaries of your program. Their purpose is to act like a responsible actor, but also to find a business rationale for engaging. Eric, can I just, sorry, uh, Andy, if you don't mind, I just want to finish. Companies also, uh, what, what I'd love to do is where business really realize this is no longer a CSR issue or a, mm. a responsible business issue. It should be part of a strategic conversation with the CEOs and everybody else because once, I mean, when we did volunteering as part of our partnerships, 
you know, we knew that our colleagues, we measured the colleagues with the university, the impact had on the charity itself and NGOs, but our colleagues were coming back much more agile thinking, much more creative thinking, and much more loyal to the brand that allowed you to go and do the volunteering in the first place. And you're absolutely right, Eric, they were scoring us 12 points higher in our colleague engagement score. So it makes business sense to actually have charity partnership as core part of a strategic conversation rather, oh, that's a nice thing to do and it's over there. Um, you know, when we, to, to be able to allow a colleague to go and, you know, mentoring is the most simplest way. That's, I think, the most simplest part of, you know, volunteering. If you're sitting in an office and you're a service provider, you're a professional that, you know, you don't really make anything, to allow, give somebody an opportunity to mentor somebody who's hundreds of thousands of miles away in a refugee camp or a young person trying to start up their business, I can't tell you that impact, not only the mentee will get, but the mentor gets even more out of that conversation, that relationship than anybody else. And we've tracked it, whether it's where we set up the School for Social Entrepreneurs or the Business Connector program. Our colleagues came away much more creative and much more pro, you know, driven by that partnership. So I think businesses, once they get it, then it's really beautiful to see it come alive. Okay, we'll just close on this question and um, yeah, go ahead, Ignacio, go ahead, very quickly. Yeah, no, I, no, I, I think Kerry's question is, re is, is, is really essential and the different elements that have come, come on. The magnitude of what we're looking at means we have to change the way we are working. And, and yes, we have made so much progress in the, in the way we, we, we understand better business as, as NGOs, the way we interact, the understanding that we have. There has to be a return on investment for sure. It's not only about charity and so, and so on. And I think at least some are integrating that. But the magnitude of what we have ahead of us is just that we really have to be completely innovative in the way we're framing things. We're not in the 208 financial crisis. That, that was a, a banking crisis. So you, you, in, you inject uh, uh, liquidity. We are in something which is much more rooted in what decades have built of inequality. And we're seeing it in perhaps our, the countries where we live it's a kind of magnifying glass that we are seeing how, how people are struggling more than others, how jobs are being lost. But what's happening in those countries with hu existing humanitarian crises is, is of another dimension. And, 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 and that's why, what do we need? And that's the advocacy part. We need the influence of leaders of the business world. To, to call on to humanitarian corridors, to, to bring in the, the goods, because it's not only good to produce the goods, you have to bring them to the people. You have to give, they have to serve. So it has to go all the way down the, the chain. How can also business support the supply chain for the small and medium enterprises that work so close to these and our part of these population, we often separate business and civil society. But when we talk about small and medium enterprises at the end of the, of the, of the production scale, those are the ones that are bringing the livelihood in, in, uh, in different communities. So we really, and that's why my big message is that we really have to frame how is it getting to the, to the most in, in need or what we are doing. And I really think that here we are, because of this inequality issue, we, we have to put things, we, we have to look at them in a very different perspective. And here I take one, one example. And we, look, we, we work, as IGVA, we work quite a lot on, uh, on, on system change, on uh, humanitarian financing. But if we look at just the situation of remittances at the moment, how the migrants send uh, 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 funds to their families in some of these poorer contexts and that are a lifeline. It represents sevenfold the overseas development aid. So that's seven times more than what governments are giving. What's happening to that? What's happening when in our countries, our countries, European, uh, US, there's job sca uh, scarcity, migrants are finding it more difficult, and what, just think about the undocumented migrants in, in different contexts, and they're no longer able to send the money. So one is, let, let's see how 
even if we have to dig in our reserves, we can keep these people with a salary. Two, remittances. Remittances, the cost of sending that money to the country, the financial costs in an era where we have digital and so on, it has gone down. It used to be 10%. Now we're closer to a three or 4%. Could we not say that for the next six months, the, the, the finance companies are not taking that three, four percent away. Three, four percent is a lot because it gets to the people down there that need it. And that's what we have to be looking at. How are we bringing the things right down to the people that need it? Harry, let's get back to you, Kerry. Fascinating responses. Did you get yeah. what you were looking for? Yeah, definitely. That's wonderful. And it, it is interesting to think about how you were approaching businesses before and in light of this, because it is true. We work on sustainable development in our end and trying to pivot our programs is one thing, but also trying to communicate that to our existing communities and businesses. It's really helpful to have these perspectives and the encouragement about innovation as well, because I think everybody's in that position, you know, moving forward. So thank you so much for those. Great. Thanks very much, Carrie, for your question. Um, the next question is coming from Annie Tubbs. Over to you, Annie. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Excellent. Hi, everyone. So I've got a corporate background. I'm now working in documentary filmmaking and I'm a trustee of Unseen UK, which is the charity fighting to eradicate modern slavery and running the National Helpline. I'm um, very interested in what you've been saying about the role of companies. You're preaching to the converted when it comes to the importance of companies rediscovering, owning and living their purpose. I think that's very important. I think there is, however, sadly, still a disconnect between charities, NGOs and the businesses. And I wonder what your views are on scope for or a trend for businesses seeking to be matched with specific NGOs and charities, so somebody who could sort of help with the mapping and the matching, because there is a big danger if a brand picks, you know, any cause that consumers don't find that credible. And I think it's really important for the narrative to be strong and for the connections to be real and ideally continue post COVID. That's one question I've, I've been allowed to. Um, the second one is, you know, what are we talking about? And I agree also the amounts that we need are huge. Um, in the UK, you know, a lot of support for businesses. The UK government recently earmarked £750 million for charities. Um, that's quite different from the estimated loss of £4 billion uh, that charities believe will take place within 12 weeks as a result of charity shops being shut and fundraising events being cancelled. So my question on that really is to what extent you think businesses can realistically plug partially um, this huge shortfall um, in income for charities and NGOs um, that result from the pandemic. Great, thanks Annie. So there's, there's two questions there. First is about matching um, businesses with the NGOs and charities. And the second one is about um, filling the, the shortfall. Um, is there really, Ignacio um, and Michelle, a, a large funding impact on NGOs because of the COVID-19 crisis? Um, well, maybe I could start. Um, yes, in two ways. Um, first is uh, that, um, you know, funding is being put to, as, as I said before, um, you know, countries that would normally, governments and others would, that would normally support us um, have a lot of problems in their own countries right now, right? The whole world is affected. And so there may be decreases in funding. There may be decrease, like enormous amounts of decreases in funding just because that's not on their plate right now. Um, there are also um, the problems in, um, for example, um, a government, for example, may not allow us to uh, have funds to buy masks because they want to make sure they've got enough masks in their own country, for example, right? So there are different ways that it plays out on us. And so first, first and foremost, it's related to our clients. So you know, people that we serve, it's affecting them. The second, and, the, and when that money and those supplies and things decrease, we can't do our work. If we can't do our work, um, then it has a second effect, which is our own staff. We need to pay um, workers 
Uh, now, IRC, 90, 95% of our staff are actually local staff, right? They're not international people that come in and surge into a country. Um, you know, most of our workers in Yemen are Yemenis. Most of our workers in South Sudan are South Sudanese. So it's these people who are nationals, local in these countries, that are going to suffer because we don't have the sort of cash that is um, coming in. A lot of fund donors at the moment, um, it's at certain times of the year when you expect to get funding, um, they're just saying, well, we're not sure right now. And that is very scary for NGOs because we often get funded, um, and, and, and as Ignacio knows, we're often funded in a very short-term cycle. And so you, you have to plan for people's salaries at one year at a time, sometimes even less. Um, and if you don't know that something is, you can get something in the next six months to a year, what do you do with these, with all your staff? So for so, us, it's... So in terms of Annie's uh, question, is, the, uh, is funding from the private sector able to fill that gap? Um, I think private sector should be able to, I mean, I, I'd really like to hear what Kamel and um, Eric um, would say on this, to say, I mean, I, I believe private sector could fill a certain gap um, if a lot of private sector really got behind um, NGOs. But uh, if for me, you know, as, as an NGO, we've been uh, trying to go out to, to the private sector, a range of funders. Um, as an NGO, we're never, ever fully funded. We're always uh, struggling, you know, at, at the level of what we would like to be doing, and we were never able to do what we fully do. I think if private sector funding could go a long way in terms of percentages. I, I would find that really hard to, to say how much it, they could help, but it could always helps. Eric, can you um, pick up that question? Yeah, and, and I think also something that I'd be interesting to hear from, uh, from Michelle is, is also probably considering that there might be some, you know, extra needs appearing. So this, this gap that has been identified on the funding is on the existing normal way that you are conducting your, your, your operations. But okay. imagine the health, you know, impact it will have and, and the impact on the livelihood of the people that are, you know, struggling already every day to, uh, to, to go through the day or through the week. So, mm. oh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to be uh, complicated. I very much agree with, uh, with your question, uh, uh, Annie. And uh, yes, I mean, the, the corporate sector has to take its part. Again, it's, it's a connected world. If the, if the companies do not take this responsibility, they are putting at risk their own business. Their employees need to go through that. Their customers, I mean, if you are selling a good that nobody can buy and that you cannot produce because you don't have people to work on it, I mean, you're gone. So businesses have to take this part of responsibility, working with the charities, because they are the ones who are making, uh, you know, the link between uh, for, for, the, for the people to go through uh, uh, these, uh, the, these crises. And I think businesses, uh, again, they have different ways of engaging. Funding is definitely something very uh, important, especially now. And I would also say unrestricted funding. I think it's super important also to uh, not only fund things that are directly re uh, related to, uh, to the COVID-19 response, but also just general work. I mean, the, 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 the organizations we are in contact with, uh, most of them just say like, we cannot do just our regular work, not everything that is related to COVID-19. So unrestricted funding, I think is super impo important to be considered for companies. And companies can have also a role of advocacy, I think, towards governance. Again, uh, we very much understand and we see that with companies. I mean, I run a company and, and I have also to protect my staff and to you know, put the necessary means to have business continuity. It's a priority and we have the, the chance to have you know, government supporting our businesses. But you cannot, uh, this is not things that you can look at separated. I really think that uh, businesses can do their part supporting charities, but also doing their part uh, uh, considering their own uh, uh, stakeholders and being an advocate, doing some advocacy towards the governments as well. Mm -hmm. I think the only bit that I would like to, Eric, I think you've, you've articulated it really, really well. Um, we've got a Unlike you, Michelle, businesses are hurting as well. I mean, if you look at the hospitality business, the transportation business and colleagues that I've worked with, you know, they're now worried about their jobs. We don't know where that's going. You know, I've worked with the brands like Hyatt and Marriott, you know, they're all shut down. So it's really painful to see those business not knowing what the future is going to look like after we come out of all of this. Um, 
So there is a pain there and it has to be acknowledged. And yes, they, their, their mindset has now gone very much into their own company and how do we survive and how do we look after. Um, but where I'm trying to push the boat with those companies and saying, you're, Eric, you're absolutely right. If you don't engage with your colleagues now while they're sitting at home being anxious, what are they doing? They're Googling, they're watching, they're looking at other brands and maybe look, you know what? My company didn't look after me very well while I'm at home. Actually, I might now go and work for somebody else who actually is out there doing all of this stuff, looks so passionate. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> they've got to, what's in it for them? How do they maintain and contain their staff? How do mm -hmm. they keep the loyalty of their staff during this crisis at the moment? Because they can't just keep on looking at the bottom line. If they don't have staff that will be the talent later on when they come out, they're going to have to invest even more. There may not be a brand there that actually, you know, will prosper as they did. So they have to now, they are looking internally, but how do they look after their staff? And I like to continuously keep on down that narrow, the local people on their local footsteps. What can I do? I mean, when UK went out, they wanted 100,000 volunteers for the NHS. You know, we had nearly 350, nearly a quarter, three quarters of a million people signed up to say, I want to volunteer. So people are hungry. People are keen to do and play their part. They just don't know what that might look like. So I think there is a conversation to be had very much at CEO level. So if you can go and tap in at the CEO, what is the CEO doing? Where are the execs? What are their passion? What are their own personal passions? Because if you can find out what a CEO's passion is, that's usually the gateway to open that conversation within the company and saying, right, okay, you know, this is really close to my heart. Guys, I want to do this. So actually get at the CEO level, but also stay local. Stay local, go to your local companies, your SMEs, the local branch of the you know, big brands. They're the ones that will make the noise and say, we want to help this charity or that charity and connect that way. So keep it really, really simple. It'll be the voices of the company that will make the company wake up and say, right, we want to do something here. This is, uh, it's been a fascinating conversation so far. And we're going to take, we're going to extend, if uh, you don't mind, and the attendees don't mind, we're going to extend this a, a, a little longer. Unfortunately, Ignacio has, uh, has dropped off the call. Um, but we're going to take two questions from the floor back to back. Um, the first one is from Mark Downs. And the second one will be from Matthew Barrett. So, Mark, over to you first. Uh, hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Oh, thanks, Andy. Hello, everybody. It's really um, fascinating insights. Um, I run a production company called Green Eyed Monster Films, and we make sustainability films for a range of um, people across the UK. And one of the big stories that came out of the UK this uh, recent time is about um, a World War II veteran called Tom Moore. Yeah. Who walked a hundred yards um, up his, down his garden in, in the, the goal was to raise a thousand pounds. And I think uh, to go back to what Kamel just said there a minute ago about people are hungry to get involved, to volunteer, to donate. And I think he's just smashed 28 million in terms of funds raised. So like, that's just, one he turns a hundred years this week you know he's a hundred yeah. years old and he's raised 28 million and i think well to get to my question like it's how did that happen you know it's about timing it's about the narrative surrounding him it's about the cause that we all find ourselves needing to address at the moment and i'm just wondering if that's what charities need going forward is it it's an element of all those things coming together and people go right this is how i can help i can't give my services or do anything but this is a story this is what this is what i believe in this is how i help so i I'd just like to get the panel's kind of response on that thanks mark and uh, Matthew, we'll take, uh, we'll take your question as well um, as the last question, and then we'll hand it back to the panellists. Over to you, Matthew. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm Matthew Barrett. Uh, I'm founder of an organisation called Goal Click. Um, we're a media and storytelling organisation that works with NGOs and refugees, um, principally using football, although there's not that much of that going on right now um, at any level. Um, so my question... There's been a few um, good examples and a few fails already. Um, how do businesses communicate the stories of their impact um, to customers without it being seen as inappropriate PR 
um, and yeah, making sure that people know what they're doing without being seen to be, um, I guess, jumping on the bandwagon. Thanks very much, Matthew. Panelists. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, I, oh, please go ahead. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eric. So, Mark, first of all, to your question, um, you know, yeah, um, Captain Tom, you know, he just created such a huge wave of empathy, didn't he, and his, and his drive. And um, so it brings me back down to storytelling. So he told a story, you know, he's, he's this military man and he wants to raise a thousand pound and he wants to walk up and down his, you know, his yard. And I think storytelling is, is a way of actually really igniting people, igniting people's emotions. Um, I'm really honored to be a non-exec on a company called TLC Lions. And what we do, we go into big corporates, particularly just to engage corporates through the lens of inclusion, diversity, and well-being through storytelling. So we've got some incredible people who've gone through loads of trauma and come out the other end. It's actually, how did that person come out? So I, I do believe storytelling helps, ignites people's emotion, gets their uh, imagination, gets them wrapped up into that ethos, but also then they feel part of that story. What are the role they're playing? And like I said, right in the beginning, everybody wants to feel valued. Everyone wants to feel that they're doing their part even if it's this is me paying a contribution to Tom's, you know, donation that I played a part and I, you know, and then they could talk to their friends. Yeah, I saw that and I, and I felt obliged to donating. I think everybody wants to be part of that big story. So I think that, you know, storytelling is key. How do we get our charities to really tell the stories of their beneficiaries, the refugees, you know, uh, there was a gentleman called Mo who filmed when he, you know, uh, came over the boat and you know and got to the other end and got that BAFTA award in the end Mo you know that was the story of his in perils of walking across and surviving and it really helped brought home actually what it felt like you know being a refugee so I think sometimes we assume we know um, in our little world is actually how do the charities really bring your but use your beneficiaries if I, I hate to use the word use but get them to tell the story how they are suffering what are they doing? Um, for me, any story about a child and a mother would really, you know, grapple me as a grandmother. How can a child be surviving out there with no food, no, no shoes in the... So it's actually, I think storytelling is, is a key part of what you need to do. Um, and then going on to, to, maybe I'll pause before I go into Matthew's. Eric, did you want to come in there? Maybe we yeah, no, it's, it's probably... Time. It's, it's, thank you, Kevin. It's quite in line what you're saying. I think what, what has been done here is probably, you know, the training that the future fundraisers will get on their first day. You know, you need a good cause, good timing, good story to tell, feel of, uh, you know, the feeling of proximity, etc. So very much agree. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very good uh, case for fundraising. But just to add something on this, we need to be also cautious about the fact that not all causes, not all crises are so uh, sexy, so to say. So it, it's also, we need to keep in mind that there are some hidden crises, protracted crises, forgotten causes, places that, you know, people were underfunded uh, uh, organizations or type of work. And it, it needs to be balanced also. So keep in mind also that it's nice to be supporting the one that are uh, opening the, the news uh, uh, at, at, at eight, uh, at eight o'clock PM. Uh, it's also good to think about how we can, you know, make a difference within the communities we are living in. Uh, and, and give it a thought also to understand why some organizations are responding to some crises uh, that are, you know, sometimes not uh, making the headlines. So I think it's important also to, to say that. I'm just a little bit conscious of time here, and perhaps that's a good segue over to Matthew's question about um, businesses communicating their stories without it appearing like inappropriate public relations. Um, Ignacio, welcome back. <laughs> yes, a bit frustrated. I dropped. I dropped off. But yeah, okay. we'll, we'll go to Michelle, and then we'll, to give you a bit more time, and um, so you can pick up on the on the conversations. I mean, I, I think um, you know, in all forms of communication, I think you have to be um, honest and transparent um, and be empathetic. And I think um, you can't really go, go wrong if you, if you are that way, uh, regardless of what business that you're in. And, you know, Kamel, when you were speaking earlier, you know, you have to show that you care about your, you know, your staff um, and, and what you do and that you have passion in it. 
And um, I don't think, I think that's possibly the only way I can think of if I wanted to, you know, communicate um, to my customers, if I had a business, um, this is how I would do it. I just want to link back to Mark's question. Um, you know, we have plenty of stories um, you know, around the world uh, of, you know, lots of lots of difficulties that people are facing, you know, from children to mothers, um, you know, people who've, you know, suffered in, in just horrendous uh, things in their lives. Um, but, you know, it's, it would be really good also to partner at this point in time to get some of those stories out because we have ways of getting stories and, and things, but um, maybe, you know, it's, it's through um, uh, agencies like yours that could help us put together a film or, um, you know, free media space or something like that just to help um, charities and NGOs like us to get a bit more of that, uh, you know, that gentleman, I mean, that is amazing. I, I saw that footage and, uh, you know, they got like front news. Um, you know, there are I've got hundreds and thousands of stories of, um, you know, lots of people for many years. And, and this, I come to Eric's point, um, you know, many situations that have been going on for decades and, and people don't get that story out. And it would be great to have that sort of support to get some, mm -hmm. you know, get a real, get stories out more, more, um, uh, in, in not just during a crisis, but uh, uh, throughout uh, time, thanks. Can, can I just add, I mean, it's going to Matthew's question about, you know, um, how ethical is it to, to promote a bank and saying, or any business saying we, we're partnering up. Look, I think long as it's real and it's relevant, so when, especially when you've got a partnership that showcases it's a partnership approach, and that charity partnership goes all the way through the DNA of your company, whether it's through your products or through the, how the colleagues are behaving and the volunteering that they're, they're doing, what the money, what impact the money's actually had and why it's had. I think then there's, there's, there's no reason why you should then get, 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 get kicked back. I think in a British society, we're very stiff up a lip. We start, you know, think, oh, it's not the right thing to do to talk about charity partnership. Mm. But I think it absolutely is. Customers mm. want to know what you're doing. Customers want to see what you're doing. Long as it's not just handing over a check and has not got no synergy or anything to do with your business, then I think, yes, it could feel a bit disingenuous. I think long as a charity partnership showcases that this is true to us we live it we breathe it we've supported it we've created something and our people are involved you'll see it in our branches and our products and our communication then i think it's absolutely right from everything from ceos from our communication that you can talk about it and i don't think there is any reason why not to to, to stop it mm. i couldn't couldn't okay. agree more with you camel uh, i think it's uh this time of of uh, being ashamed of of uh, promoting it or talking about it is 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 past. I mean, people need to talk about it. I mean, obviously in an ethical way. That's you yeah. know, and people who are dealing with it are smart people, so I'm sure they can do it. And it's more about it's not that much about what you do, but it's about how you do it. And this is exactly what you're mentioning, Gamal. Like the way people, if if it's along you know a deep and well thought partnership, that it's a trusted partner, that there's mutual understanding. I mean, it, it's good that you communicate about how you engage and what the people you are supporting and the organization you're supporting is delivering. I mean, so no shame about communication as far as the way you're engaging is good and, and, and the way you are communicated is ethical. Yeah. What we'll do is we'll, we'll turn to Ignacio to contribute to this and then we'll ask you each, starting with Ignacio, for your last key message that you want to convey to people on this call. And then unfortunately, we'll, we'll have to close up back to you Matthew. okay thank you yeah on the communication just to say and this goes to business as much as ngos of how important it is to be honest as an ngo sector we have oversold what we can really do and that is very dangerous we have to come up with positive stories and so on mm -hmm. but we also have to find the way of translating how complex it is mm -hmm. and being honest and in particular in, this, in these moments, we're seeing it. Who are the leaders that we, that we really are attracted to? They're the ones who are honest, who say that they don't know when they don't know. And those are the ones that are leading us and with which we, we do have empathy and we want, to, we want to trust. And rapidly, if I may, Andy, on the question of how are NGOs doing, we have to be concerned. We have to be concerned because the financial resilience of many of the NGOs of this structure 
is not strong enough to take the shock which is coming. Now, this is, there are many different types of business models and so on, but this is going to be shaking the business model of NGOs. And this is at a moment where we really do need these organizations because they're the ones who reach the closest to the populations that we want to, we want to serve. So that, uh, I'm, I'm really happy at, an, at another moment, I know I don't have it here, to go a little bit and which are the ones that are more, more challenged, certainly the, the national ones and local uh, organizations, but also in the UK, when there are predictions of 13% of decrease of GDP, that means two, two billion in terms of ODA, of which part goes to NGOs and that are transferred then into the, the, the ground. And then as last, as last word, I, I want to thank you all. And I found it extremely uh, interesting to be on this, uh, on this panel. And there are a, no a number uh, of ways to facilitate the bridging between the interests of NGOs and the interests of the business. There are business mechanisms in which we work with, with IOE. There's of, of course the Global Refugee uh, uh, Forum Momentum where, where uh, uh, business has entered also in lots of, uh, and, and there are lots of ways of doing. And I'm we're at IGVA, we've opened uh, a, a, a contact point, uh, which is with business at, igvanetwork.org, so with business at igvanetwork.org, we will be happy to continue the, co the conversation uh, uh, and, and also at some moment direct perhaps towards some of our members as there was that question also that came up of how do you match? <laughs> there, are, there are lots of questions that we've been un unable to get around to. One, one which is very close to my heart and I think to a couple of yours that's been put in the chat for example, is about be best practice with partnerships between businesses and NGOs. Um, we might uh, hopefully have a webinar just on that subject. Um, but any last closing um, key messages from anybody else? Just to say that the information like Ignacio has just mentioned, we'll be putting into a follow-up um, email to those of you that have registered for these uh, digital discussions. So. Um, can I just say then, um, actually, what's really critical um, you know, with business and NGOs, um, I think partnerships have to be really about true collaboration and trust. And I really believe that we should be looking not just at short term, what can we do now, but whatever partnerships we do, really think about longer term investments, because there's always going to be a next time. And we've seen in the partnerships that we have with business, you know, they came straight into action because we'd invested and they'd invested in us, that we invest in them uh, as true partners. They've got technical expertise that we don't necessarily have. We've got frontline knowledge, um, you know, evidence-based approaches that they don't necessarily have. And marriage, it has to be a true collaboration and a true marriage. Um, and if you look to the long term and invest together, you can actually do amazing things together. And so I would say, you know, invest, um, not just for COVID, but invest now for also the future. Thank you. Um, for myself, my final remarks will be first of all on the business side, is when a company finds its purpose and employees find their purpose, you know, everybody as human nature wants to add value. So if you allow people to go and do something, I think that constantly will come back and help you as a brand and pay back. But if you're on the other side of the fence, knocking on the door as a charity or an NGO, please do your research, do your homework, understand the values and behaviors of that company, where they're trying to go, and how what's the win-win scenario? What would that partnership look like? Because then it's more sustainable. You're more likely to actually get the partnership over the line and it's more gonna take longer. And then finally, just one thing, I think as everybody, individual, whether you're in charities or NGOs or sitting as a CEO, is mentoring. What role can you play to help mentor somebody else? Because I think that's the most beautiful partnership that one can have and can really, you never know where that conversation could lead or what door it could open, whether for you or for the person you're mentoring. Well, two, I'd, I'd be very brief because it's the end of, of, uh, of the time, I think we're, we're over. So I have two, two small messages. The, the first one is this situation shows more than ever that we are all on the same boat, whether we are you know, companies, individuals, yeah. charities, governments. 
So we need to work together and see what each of these, you know, how any of these uh, entities can take its, its parts. Uh, again, very much in line with what has been said before, but, you know, taking the time also not during in times of peace, I would say, whenever there's not a huge crisis, but to build, you know, these partnerships because it's allowed to be much faster in the response whenever you've been preparing. Have a proper strategy, whether it's on the NGO side or charity side or whether it's on the company side. It's important also to have it well thought uh, to make sure that it's responding to where you want to go. And uh, maybe uh, uh, my second last word is just to all of you stay safe because, I mean, obviously we are taking part of uh, a really, well, we all have a responsibility in the way we are behaving and though affecting all the different uh, people we are and entities we are in touch with. And Ignacio, last word to you. You get two last words. If it's two last words, then let's facilitate the bridging and with business at igvanetwork.org and we'll try, we'll try our best. Right. Thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you to Kamel, Michelle, Ignacio and Eric. And thank you to everybody who's turned up uh, as an attendee. We had a, a fantastic turnout, a really rich discussion and very, very practical, which is um, exactly what we're aiming for. We will be disseminating a recording of this to everybody and with some key messages and some contact details as well to keep the conversation and the, and the uh, contacts going. Thanks very much. Stay safe, everybody, and stay sane. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks very much.